All right, so I'm Jonathan Weinberg, and I'm Michaela Griffo. Great, and it is uh, July 1st, it's about 11 in the morning in New Haven, and I'm here to paint uh, Michaela's portrait and to talk to her about art and life and etc. Okay. <laughs> So one of the things that I've been doing in the interviews is really asking artists how did they how did they become an artist? You know, where what's their what's that story? Like when did you decide that this is what you're going to be and sort of start telling us a little bit about your life? I that think that I would have to say art was my first love from the time I was a very small child. I loved drawing. My mother would take me to the University of Rochester where they had a museum, a small museum, and they would have drawing classes. And I lived for those moments. Um, you know, it was like reading. Uh, there were two things that took me out of life, and I, as life as I knew it, in a very violent alcoholic home. Um, so it was the quietness of both the drawing and the quietness of when I discovered that books. I remember that one of the first books, I was only about seven or eight years old when I read A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Oh. And as I was reading it, it just, the world disappeared. I was so young that I didn't even know what these two adults were doing when they were describing sex. I, I had no idea what was going on, but but the whole story, I, it just transported me to another world. And that's what art always did for me. But for how, years... How old, uh, how old would you have been, you think, when you were... When I was reading that book? Probably, yeah. be, I was probably about eight years old. Okay. I was very precocious. Um, by the time, I, I remember by the time I was seven, um, I had read all the books in the children's library. And so my mother uh, went to the library and got me an adult library <laughs> card. I was a very precocious child in many ways. Um, I was always I remember when I, because I started reading at a very young age, that's why I say, by the time I was seven, I had read all the books in the children's library. I remember when first... Where, where was this? Rochester, New York. Uh -huh. I grew up in Rochester, New York, which plays a big part in why I became an artist as well. Um, and so when I, I was in first grade, uh, the first day of first grade, the teacher was handing out that, you know, look, Jane, look, spot, see, Jim Run or whatever, you know, that book they give you in first grade. And while she was handing out the book, I read the whole book. And I brought it up to the nun's desk and I said, that's really boring, don't you have anything else? And she called my mother. And my mother was, the principal was always calling my mother. That was the text, that was the reader for the entire year and I had read it while she was passing out the books to oh the other goodness. children. So I was allowed to bring my own books to school after because I was just really bored. Um, I kept being moved up and up and up and finally by the time I was 11, I was in high school. And oh goodness. my mother said, that's it, no more. Because I was, I had no idea what these these high school girls were talking about going all the way and all this stuff. The world was a mystery to me mm -hmm. because I lived in books and in my sketch pads and in, I lived in another world. And I, I still remember that, you know, we have this one with, you know, scholarship student, uh, some poor Irish girl from, you know, the other side of the tracks so in this, you know, convent school. And one day we were in gym class, and she knew I was only a, about 11 or 12. I, I had no idea about anything. With, and she ripped open her gym suit, and she said, look what my boyfriend did. And there were these red blotches all the way down her neck. Under, oh, and nice. I didn't know what. I thought he put cigarette burns on her. I didn't know. I was horrified. And it just terrified me. It was things like that. I had no idea about anything. I didn't. I knew that I was being sexually abused. Not a well. It was my father was touching me in very inappropriate ways and saying mm -hmm. inappropriate things, and my world just wasn't safe. And when I was a, a junior in high school, I still had a year to go. My friend Judy and I had saved my babysitting money and her babysitting money and she put me on a train for New York City and said, you know, 
you have to get out of there. You're, they're going to kill you there. You're going to die. And we had, I had my babysitting money, and I had a box of chocolate chip cookies, and I came to New York. And how old were you at that point? I was 14 years old. Oh, my goodness. Um, and I have hung out. Uh, many people know the story. I hung, that summer, I hung out in the East Village. And that's where I met some of the people I even know today. And, um, and what year would this be? This would have been 1963. Um, and what we would do is, in those days in the East Village, mm -hmm. it was all Ukrainian and older Jewish people and all of that. It had not yet become, uh, you know, a drug capital of the world or mm -hmm. whatever. And people didn't lock their doors. And so we would look in the back of the Village Voice where they would have the ads and see what was for rent. And we'd go there, we'd move in, because nothing was locked. We'd take showers, we'd put food in the, plug in the refrigerator until the landlord oh found us. And then we'd all find another apartment to go and stay in. And, and we kind of were like... What happened to your, your parents, though? I mean, weren't they, like, freak, freaking out that no, you were just... No, uh, during no. At no time in my life were, were they concerned. Hmm. Uh, let's just put it that way. Um, what did, sorry to back up, but what did they do? What was their, you know, what did your mother do? What was your father's? My father, I am the product of the nightmare combination of the alcoholic doctor and the drug addicted mother. Uh -huh. And so whenever we had a feeling as a child, my mother would say, you shouldn't feel that way. And we were given a drug. So my feelings were wrong. Because your father could just prescribe whatever. Whatever. Right. I and so not only were our feelings wrong and not in tune with what was actually going on, because we were told that wasn't what was happening, reality that it was like I could see the emperor had no clothes, and that became the basis for all of my art, that I saw what was happening, I was told it wasn't happening, and, you know, given a drug. So, but or alcohol. It's interesting that they, but they didn't share with you the birds and the bees kind of thing. It sounds like you said that they, right? So that's I funny. Went, you know, I mean, in those days, father. the in a <coughs> convent school, the only thing I remember was right before the junior prom, which I couldn't go to because I was too young, and also my everybody knew that my boyfriend was Jewish, and that was not going to happen. So um, they played this record called "The Unwed Mother." And it was all about, you know, if you dance cheek to cheek, the boy becomes aroused. I had no idea what these words meant. Hmm. I knew nothing about, you know, I knew about a male anatomy because of my father. Um, and, but I didn't, I didn't. So he was, he was exposing himself to you. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And when I would tell my mother, I, I, this started when I was like two and a half, three years old. And I, my mother would say, oh, your father would never do something like that. What three-year-old knows in a male male anatomy? I mean, it wasn't like I was taking baths with my older brother or something. Right. Um, so anyway, um, that's. I ended up in New York, and probably it was right around July. I was down by the piers. They used to call it Tar Beach, and everybody would go down there on Sundays. There were all those piers on the on the uh, west side, high, around the west side, and. There was this very attractive woman sitting there reading the New York Times in her beach chair. And we started talking, and she thought I was this really cool kid. And she asked me, you know, so what was I, where did I live, what was I doing? And that woman became the mother I never had. And it's very important because that woman is the basis for the painting that was in the Art After Stonewall show. Oh, uh, my cool. funny Valentine. I really said one of the things we didn't um, say is like the reason that how we met. You know, just to back up, um, right. I met McKellen when I started to go through the process of cu uh, of curating this show, Art After Stonewall, which was created to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots, and. Um, right from the almost from the beginning when we were doing the show everybody said oh there's this incredible artist that you have to 
talk to and see her work, and that was Michaela. And then we, I don't know, minute I, <laughs> I met you. I was like, this person's amazing. I think it was Carla J that first told me about you. But I, I as I remember, there were two different people who said probably uh, Flavia and Flavia also. Yes. Yeah, but I think it was almost simultaneously. They both were saying, "You, you yeah. have to." And Flavia. And I'm glad. I mean, I, you know, because I, oh, I. Well, there, we'll get into that about. But anyway. Anyway, so we we um, and in that show is the painting. When when you my tell funny Valentine, um, right. and what that painting shows is when I went to live with Dee Dee. I mean, she brought me home. Dee Dee was. And t can you tell her? Tell her is it right to say her, her, her full name? Yes, I mean she's she's gone. Her name is Dee Dee Fries, F R I E S, and Dee Dee had been the mistress of a mafioso, as she always says, she and her friend Corinne were the only two white girls in Newark High School. Hmm. And she was beautiful. And when she was 15, she became the mistress of a very big mafioso. And she used to do the books for the bi whatever business he was running. She took bookkeeping in high school and she became, <laughs> and she was making all this money for him. <laughs> she was, you know, whatever. And he said she was the best bookkeeper. The, the, the mob took notice of how a great bookkeeper she was. And she was beautiful. <laughs> Long story short, by the time I met her, she was 33 and, she, and the mafioso was killed, of course, <laughs> long ago. And she was running one of the top houses on the Upper East Side. I mean, her clients were senators and movie stars and whatever. And, you know. Brothel? You mean oh, yes. Okay. Oh, good. Oh, I'm sorry. They were called houses. They were called houses. But anyway. No, 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 no. Just, and, you know, just to be you know, pure, and her old girls, fashioned 19th century. Even in those job. days, yeah. uh, you know, a weekend with one of her girls would cost you, you know, a couple of thousand. So, so just backing up here, this is so amazing. So, so they were called houses in the in the sixties. Yes, that would be a yes. Right, you, right. you wouldn't say oh, it was a bra. They say no, you know, no. She ran one of the better houses, Got and it. it was one of the better ones and the most profitable ones on the Upper East Side. Um, you know, but she didn't. I didn't live there. I lived with over off of um, uh, Central Park um, in the seventies, with where she had a brownstone over there, and. That was also, you know, I here I am, I'm fresh out of the convent school. I still have another year to go, so I had to go back to graduate. Boy, by the time I went back, I knew a lot more about life. Not now you know a lot. I, I know a lot. lot. Yes. And so what you saw in that painting was this dichotomy, this very lovely 1950s. Some of them were, I, there was a whole series, which I later destroyed in a drunken fit, but that one survived. Um, you know, it's a very sweet scene from the 1950s, and then, of course, two women dressed in fetish clothing, kissing, and it's called My Funny Valentine, and it was dedicated to her because I knew nothing about normal sex. I certainly didn't know about homosexuality, you know, any kind of dominatrix business going on, whatever. I learned all of that through osmosis of just, you know, knowing what was going on in that apartment on the Upper East Side. Hmm. And uh, that, so the, my very first series of paintings was about that. It was always that dichotomy, whether it was two men, uh, I had one with uh, a man licking the boots, of, wearing a collar and a, and a thing in his mouth of a man wearing those striped pants that a trooper, a state trooper, you know, only saw from the waist down. And, you know, and then again, a very sweet little, you know, like what would have been a little boy's room with planes and trains and what, what anyway. But, but these paintings are, are, are considerably later than, they weren't done at the time, they were memories in, in essence. Oh yeah, they were done in the, in the early 80s. 80s yeah, right. they were only place that would show them was the Alternative Museum uh, and they were shown, I believe, in 78, I think it was, because I would, you know, I would show the work to people, and they go, oh, can't show this, including the woman who was my mentor, Holly Solomon. Um, and also, as, as I'm growing up, alcohol and drugs are playing a much uh, bigger part in my life. But what happened was, because I lived in Rochester, New York, and again, I was always looking places to escape my home. 
I spent days every you know every Saturday I would go to the George Eastman house in Rochester New York where Beaumont Newhall at that time was the curator mm -hmm. and we he knew I was fascinated by everything about photography and so we would put on the gloves and the mask and he would take me in the back and I held actual Dorothea Lang photographs you know uh, Julia Margaret Cameron um, Margaret Burke White and that's how I knew that a woman could be an artist, but I thought a woman could only be a photographer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the story picks up much later of my being an artist when I took a class at the University of Michigan. My undergraduate degree is in pre-med mm. because I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. Today, that is the only regret I had is that I did not become a doctor. Hmm. I'm kind of over. What, you say a word like Beaumont Newhall, and he's a legend, a legendary figure. You know, it's sort of cool to know to hear about that. that right. That he and was, not uh, only did that I he introduce you to photography. Right. That's like he's the person that I, you know, that I probably would have first learned about photography from. You know, yeah, his book. And his I was book, so right. lucky that yeah. he was just this older man who was so kind and spent so much time and told me the story about Dorothea Lang, how people would throw milk bottles at her and she went out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> during the Farm Security Administration. And I just thought, wow, this is great. So I knew that women could be photographers, but, but I still, you know, I was still, I'm still drawing, whatever. But um, well, the at that change time, happened. Jan, you know, Jansen's History of Art book did not, I don't think it had a single painting by a woman in it. So I right. had no idea. Right. So anyway, I when I was at the University of Michigan, I had taken all my regular courses, and I took a course in painting. I thought, oh, I'll take a, an elective in painting. I was getting toward my, I was thinking it was my junior year. So the teacher, I can't remember his name, said, you know, and that, um, I can't remember who his idol was, but it was some French Impressionist or whatever, Bernard, mm -hmm. and that that was painting. And mm -hmm. so I've been, I'm coming from New York City, right? I mean, that's where mm -hmm. I spend my summers and, mm -hmm. you know, and I've seen by now, I've seen Andy Warhol's work, I've seen Jasper Johns, I'm seeing all the pop artists. Right. So my very first painting, and we had to make a painting every two weeks, and so my very first painting was of a delicatessen front in uh, Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. and, or is he there at the Liberty uh, Bar or whatever and, and with the big thing of the beer thing. But anyway, it was, I started painting the, the, the Pepsi Cola sign around the deli and all the, you know, all the, you know, the sort of pop art type stuff. Um, you know, uh, sandwiches, signs and all of that. And then there was this big huge window and I only had two weeks and I, I started to pencil in the window part, which was gray, it wasn't black and it wasn't in color, the way the Pepsi sign and the sandwich signs and the, you know, all of those were, it was in black and white. And I loved the way the pencil looked up against the color, the bright mm -hmm. color. And then also, because we only had two weeks, of course I couldn't finish the painting, and it was all this white space. Mm -hmm. And so, and. I brought my painting and you know he just like you know disparaged me and you know I guess he was grateful I was a pre-med student and not an art student but you know after about the fourth painting which again was you know very pop arty one was the the front of this it was called the Liberty Bar this big beer can beer with a beer you know flowing over again mm -hmm. the drapes and the window were done in pencil Finally, toward the end of the semester, he said, you know, I don't, he said, this isn't painting. I don't know what it is. He said, but, you know, I hope to God you don't take another semester of painting. Well, Goodness. So, so anyway, no, that's, that's, what happened that was because I too. knew that I, my work was not considered art. My painting was considered art. You didn't know what the hell they were, but they weren't art. Um, two things were happening concurrently. I started investigating, because I used to love some of the places in Ann Arbor, the old Ann Arbor, the original railroad station, which I believe was built in the 1800s, it was beautiful, it was no longer used, but I would go on these like, you know, forays around uh, Ann Arbor, and even into Detroit, these old buildings for me. Then, um, I, at the same time, my counselor said, asked me what 
I wanted to do and I said of course I'm going to apply for medical school and he said oh with your brains uh, you know straight A student uh, you'd make a wonderful gynecologist pediatrician or obstetrician three areas of medicine I had absolutely no interest in whatsoever but it was because I was a woman I oh, told that's him, yeah. I said, no, I want to be a neurosurgeon because I need access to brain physiology because I believe that psychosis is not necessarily brought on by trauma. I be- and this is, this is in 1966. Hmm. I believe that, that trauma is, that psychosis is brought on often by chemical imbalances in the brain. Well, he looked at me like I was nuts. And he said, well, he said, there isn't a medical school in this country that will allow you to be a neurosurgeon. He said, that's cardiology and neurosurgeon are reserved for men. He said, that's why I'm saying you would make a great gynecologist. But I'm like, okay, so now I'm getting, not only could I not be a painter, I could not be a neurosurgeon. So I started looking into art schools. Uh, because I, I, I continued to paint in my little place. I continued to do my photography. And I applied to Pratt Institute. Oh. And I got a letter from Ralph Wickheiser, who was then the dean. And I told him the whole story. I said, I've never taken any. I took one class and I got thrown out. He thought my work was genius. He said, Nan, who Nan Benedict was the associate, director, whatever, So I ended up going to Pratt Institute on a graduate teaching fellowship, and Pratt changed my life. And I went there, my, my, I did not major, I minored in painting, and I majored in photography. Things happened while I was a student at Pratt, one which broke my heart, the other one which set me up for being the artist that would say the emperor has no clothes, Be, not being afraid to say what I saw and to paint it. Um, because at a certain point I realized I could not say what I wanted to say about culture and the world we live in with just a camera. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first thing that happened was in my last year there, I think it was, we, we had, um, Irving Sandler uh, was invited to come and look at the graduate students' work, Mm -hmm. the paintings. And we put our paintings in the room, and I was one of the few women uh, in that class. This was the class of 1970. Um, And Irving Sandler was looking at the paintings, and he gets to my paintings, and he goes nuts. Wow, this is is wonderful. Who? What? Mm-hmm. And he, and he, and so the the paint. I can't remember even the painting teacher's name. Said, "Well, those are Michaela's paintings." He said, "A woman did these paintings." Walked away and then say another word. God. And that told me what I was going to face in the modern day painting world. So we were supposed to choose who we wanted to teach the graduate uh, seminar that year. And. I wanted Danny Lyons. I don't know if you're familiar with Danny Lyons yeah, and Lee Friedlander right. because I love their work. But right. everybody wanted this woman named Diane Arbus. And oh. I said, I never heard of Diane Arbus, but because everybody was so adamant about Diane Arbus, well, of course, that's who came to Pratt. So in walks this very kind of short, she wasn't very tall, and with this brush cut. And she starts showing her, like, I was mesmerized by everything she said because she was saying what I, you know, nothing is ever the same as they said it was. It's the things I've never seen before that I recognize. That like was like, yes. And she was holding up the drawings, I mean the uh, photographs of things like, you know, the trans woman or and this one guy said to her why are you showing us pictures of these freaks well she was only about five four but i think she grew to about five nine in that second and she <laughs> said to him who are you to call these people freaks <laughs> she said what indignities in your life have you suffered that you have the audacity to judge these people she said these people 
our aristocrat, she said, get out of this room. I never want to see you here and here again. She lived around the corner in Westbeth. I had no idea. And I was standing outside where I lived on Horatio Street. And she came up and she said, oh, you live here, whatever. And I think she just wanted to see the inside of my apartment. There was some, there's something about her. She liked, I think she liked to see the way people live. And so I said yes, and that I was a painter and whatever, and that, you know, I, she came into my, and I had my paintings hanging on the wood that I had done as a student at Pratt. And I also had photographs. I, I wanted to show her my photographs. And she's, she's very pleasant. She's looking at the photographs. She's looking around, you know. And she said, you know, these photographs are really beautiful, she said, but I see something in these paintings. She said, do me a favor, become a painter. And I never picked up the camera after that. I became Goodness. a painter. I didn't know that, but a great story. Yeah. Huh. And then she died on my birthday, July 26. I believe it was in 1971. It was after I graduated from Pratt. I was transfixed by hmm. her work and by who she was. And there was something very, very interesting about her character. Um, she saw, she saw things in people and places that it, well, you know. I mean, I forgot who said it. They said giving a giving a camera to Diane Arbus was like giving a hand grenade to a child. Well, no, I mean the other thing is I, I saw a show of hers oh a few years ago though I, I might have been at Robert Miller or something like that, and there was just a there was one photograph of a bar stool, and it made you cry. It's like it wasn't it wasn't just people. She was the I she's yes. probably my most favorite photographer. I mean, it's just. A, the photograph of a Christmas tree, or in Levittown, you know, right? right. Levittown right. Christmas tree. I yeah. Mean, and the, the other thing that bothers me, I can go on about Arbus, but one of the things that bothers me is that people put her into this box, and they, yes, she photographed people who are un unusual and marginalized, but she did so many different kinds right. of photographs, and she really is the great photographer of adolescence. You know, I just feel oh, she yes. gives you that sense of what it, you know, of loss and loneliness and. You know, she does these whole series of, of photographs that are really about fairy tales, you know, like of the uh, Disneyland, the picture of the of the um, castle in Disneyland is just mm -hmm. amazing. It breaks your heart. They, they're just really a whole day. Anyway, she's an amazing right. pic and, photographer. And that yeah. she gave to me that, that it's okay to say what people don't want to hear mm -hmm. and to paint what people don't want to see. Right. And that's exactly what my work has always been about, whether it's the watercolors, the paintings, the right. drawings. Um, you know, and that, so when I graduated from Pratt, then I became a painter. And um, I was very lucky. My work, uh, right from the start, even though my personal life was going downhill because of alcoholism and drug addiction. So that by the time, I think it was around, my first, very first show that I was in was at the Aldrich Museum. And every year, Larry, this one Larry Aldrich was still alive. Every year Larry would go to studios in New York um, where the young painters who had never had any show and he would have this big show con about contemporary art up at the Aldrich Museum. And out of 50, I think there were 50 paintings, my painting and I forgot his name, but he's in the Metropolitan, his painting ended up in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, and I drank and drugged my way into oblivion. Um, we were the only two uh, works that were, were bought by a place called the Treadwell Corporation. Right, a very did. huge. I remember this because we were looking right. contemporary art right. collection. I mean Helen Frankenthaler. I mean you name it, and they owned it. And I was, I was in. I still have the the paper of, about where in the offices my painting mm -hmm. was, and it was in the same room with like you know some really uh, up there painters. And of course that was the painting we could never find my portrait, which again was you know oil. And pencil on canvas with a lot of white so, space. So we ne it never got found? No, uh, never found. Maybe it. somebody will see this video. And I hope so. I, I was kind of hoping that they would maybe read the art after Stonewall or whatever. Well, but it still, still could happen. Uh, anyway, so that was, and so my second show was a two-person show at the Soho Center for Visual Artists on Prince Street. 
and that was the Aldrich Museum in New York City. That mm -hmm. was there, and that was where I showed what was called the Convent School series. And the paintings were all about my life in the Convent School. And what they were were, you know, like you would have a window, and outside of the window you would see dur a Durer. I used mm -hmm. a lot of Durer's work, whether it was Adam and Eve, you know, holding the branch, and then, <clears throat> or the lamb lying on the floor. And there was always like this, like, image in pink mm -hmm. of a woman, woman's, you know, like the three Marys at the foot of the cross. They were done with it in a bedroom with pink striped wallpaper. But it was this very, like, I can't even, <clears throat> spiritual and yet disturbing. The combination of the, because animals were used by dirt to represent guilt. And I had a lot of guilt about what had gone on when I was in school. Um, and so that... Well, what, why did you have guilt about well, that? Well, sexual abuse. Right. And also I was I mean, an alcoholic by the time so I So you made, was, meant in, when you were back in school in, in, in Rochester? As a child, As a yeah. child. And yeah. I was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I was four years old when I used to go around eating the cherries out of the Manhattans at my parents' uh, oh, cocktail goodness. parties. And I thought it was the cherries that were the magic elixir until my cousins and I started draining the glasses. And by the time I was 11 years old, I was bringing a flask of vodka to school and putting it in my, you know, in my locker. And so probably by the time I was 11 or 12, I was a full-blown alcoholic. And the way I became a drug addict is that when I was 12, I tried to kill my father because I was sick and tired of him with this business and he came up behind me one day and he was whispering in my ear and I this is not going to happen. I saw a knife on the kitchen table. I grabbed that knife and the only reason I'm not in Bedford Hills now is because my, my mother started screaming and my older brother who was the captain of the wrestling team at the Jesuit seminary um, grabbed a knife out of my hand. But I was put in the psychiatric ward where my father practiced, the hospital where my father practiced medicine, and... What kind of a doctor was he? He oral maxillary facial surgeon. Huh. So he had both a DDS and an MD degree. So it was a uh, possible oh, peculiar way, right? You know, I was the psychiatrist, you know, the psychiatrist came in to talk to me, and I poured my heart out to the psychiatrist for about two hours, telling him everything that I remember, every incident I could remember, whatever, and when it was over, he looked at me and said it's normal for little girls to make up stories like this about their fathers, and he put a yellow capsule in my hand, and I asked him what it was, and I could have sworn he called it a numidol. Of mm. course, it was Nambutal, and I took right. that Nambutal, and that was the basis for my drug addiction. For starting with Nambutal, my first rehab was for um, barbiturates and sedatives, because I was going into psychotic withdrawal, I couldn't get enough of them into me. My second rehab was for heroin and uh, narcotics because I didn't want to have to go into psychotic withdrawal. And so by the time Holly Solomon came to my studio in 1975 and said, you are a fucking genius. <laughs> That's exactly, she walked in, she looked at the paintings on the wall, she goes, you are a fucking genius. And in those days, I was doing work that, like the convent school, but it was getting more and more, I can't even describe what the paintings were like, but one of them was like uh, the Virgin Mary in the bathtub. Uh, they were just very, you know, um, I hadn't started the what would be called the pornographic paintings. Those came later in 1980, I started those, I think. Um, but anyway. So Holly became my first mentor. Holly Solomon paid for my first rehab. Um, she adored me. I adored her. Uh, you know. So one one thing we didn't talk about, we just jumped right over, is uh, Stonewall and what was going. Like, was there any sense that you need to get that content into the work because you were doing? Because I know you and Flavia were doing protests and right, stuff. Right, we yeah. were the ones that stood up to the mafia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, what happened is, when I was a student at Pratt, 
I was living with what had been my high school sweetheart. Mm -hmm. I had no knowledge about lesbians or, I mean, I knew from Dee Dee because, you know, the girls who made, a lot, the, her, they were beautiful, the women that worked for her, mm -hmm. who were call girls, let's put it, uh, a lot of them were gay. And so, on, and Dee Dee was, she called herself bisexual, but I knew she had a girlfriend, you know. On Sundays, I was 16 years old, on Sundays, they used to love to go down to a place called the Sea Colony, which was a lesbian bar. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all these girls, they'd go down there, and that was my first time I'd ever been in a lesbian bar, and I'd sit there, you know, and Dee Dee would say, there was this, remember this one butch number who thought she was uh, Jeff Chandler. She thought, he was, you know, she looked like that actor Jeff Chandler, you know, the short gray hair mm -hmm. or whatever. She kind of looked like Stormy. But anyway, you know, she came over and asked me to dance, and Dee Dee said, you touch my baby and I'll kill you. <laughs> so they were, I was definitely off limits to wow. any of these lesbians. But that's how I knew that there were lesbians. And, and you were, and, and Dee, Dee was a mentor. She wasn't, you weren't. She's the woman that was like a mother to me. Right, she took she me off the streets of New York. You weren't, and she wasn't your lover or something. No, no oh no, God, no. no, no. She taught me everything I know. She's the one that said don't ever rent when you can own. She taught me how to save money, how to invest money. She was smart. She taught me. I have the life I have today because I had her as a mentor. When Stonewall happened, we heard about it, of course, because we were living on Horatio Street, and I was like, well, good for them. But I had no connection to the gay community at all, nor did Peter. And so when, when it happened, um, that's all we knew was that the gays had rioted or whatever. And... So that was in 1969, that was in June of 69, and in December of 1969, I went to, I had never met Peter's family because he was an Orthodox Jew, and so we got all dressed up and we go to his place and... Um, well, obviously, he he wasn't an orth. I mean, his parents were Orthodox. Jews. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yes. Because <laughs> he wouldn't. Have but been, he was. He wouldn't have been going out. I mean, he was doing yeah, all right, those he, things. He was, right. he was Jewish, and he his went to the temple were, and all yeah, that. Yeah, but yeah, he it, wasn't like he you know, didn't fully, have the yeah, 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 and all yes, that. Yeah, yeah. And but and he anyway, going out with he was in love with me, and he wanted to marry me, and I wanted to marry him. And so the door opens, and we went out to Brooklyn, to his family's house on Ocean Parkway in Brooklyn. <laughs> the door opens up. His mother, both grandmothers, and two of her sisters were sitting on this huge couch. They all looked up, and in unison, they just said, Uh-huh, shiksa. Right. And all this Yiddish followed. Blah, 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 blah. Right, right. So I, had, I didn't even know what they were calling me. I'd never heard that word. Um, you know, so he said, here's, take, give me $10, get in the cab, go home, I'll be home later. So in those days, all the cab drivers in Brooklyn, especially, were these little old Jewish men who put their kids through city college and right. whatever by being cab drivers. Right. So I said to the cab driver, what does the word shiksa mean? He said, who called you that? I said, my fiance's family. He said, it means there isn't going to be a wedding. That's what it means. So sure <laughs> enough, you know, we tried and... So here we get to the gay stuff. Now, when I was, you know, when I knew Dee Dee, a friend of mine got pregnant and we needed an illegal abortion. And I asked Dee Dee, help me, where do we go? And she sent us to this place in Harlem. And my friend nearly died, bled to death. And I was so upset that I never wanted to see any girl go through this again, that and Dee Dee's friend was a nurse, so she helped us, you know, we got, this cab driver got us out of Harlem. He knew, I think, knew what was going on, but got us back to 72nd Street, and, or 75th Street. And so, so there was, again, I look in the back of the, villi of the Village Voice, and there's this thing about the Red Stockings, which were the first feminist group that Shulamith Firestone, who, by the way, was going out with John Duff at the time, the sculptor, um, that lived in the same area that I had that I would move into in 1971 or whatever. But anyway, um, so I became a red stocking, and we would, you know, hand out leaflets about uh, changing the abortion laws in New York. And we met at a place called the Washington Square Methodist Church, which is where a hotbed of radicalism. That's where mm -hmm. the Panthers met, the Young Lords met there, and the, you know, the Red Stockings, who were the first radical feminist group. 
So one day I'm coming out of my red stockings meeting and there's this very attractive, tall, blonde Swedish woman comes up to me and she says to me, um, would you like to go out for coffee? And I thought she wanted to know about the red stockings and radical feminism. And so I'd, yeah, oh, fine. You know, so we go out and turns out she, her best friend is Viva. And she asked me if I want to go to Andy Warhol's party. So I'm like, yeah, of course. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. So, you know, we went to Andy's parties and we went, you know, we would start. And she was, I, I knew she looked familiar. Mm -hmm. I said, Josh, you look familiar. And it turns out she looked familiar because she was Eileen Ford's top model. And of course her face was on Vogue magazine, Harper's Bazaar, you know, all the magazines. And she was the first model to ever have an exclusive contract with a product. She was Clairol. She was great body for Clairol. And so she would, you know, wherever she would travel in the world. What was her, her name? Agneta Freeberg. Okay. And if you look there's a Wikipedia page. It is all lies. Ha! Huh. Well, that's another. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, all right. So, so you're so, you're hearing the truth. From uh, me. Okay. Here we Eileen go. Eileen Ford paid a fortune to keep it out of the out of the paper that she was a lesbian and, and that she's she no was longer alive. Murdered. She was murdered by a stalker. Oh my goodness. Eileen Ford spent a lot of money to keep that out of the papers and out of the press. Um, but in any case, um, so. You know, we we're going on these, you know, I didn't know we were dating because, it, you know, in my mind, I had never, there was, I had never been attracted to a woman. I had never, you know, I knew that they existed, um, but I was in love with Peter and I was still mourning the loss of Peter. But anyway, so for six months, we're going to movies, going to Andy's parties, hanging out with Viva, Jane Fonda, all these people. Well, Who are you having Jane sex? Jane was married so? to... Are you having sex? No, no because no. I don't even know we're dating. <laughs> so That's finally, odd. now I met her in August. It was, right. the, the, it was the week after I came back from what my friend Bob told me was a small folk festival in White Lake, New York. So this is another thing I ended up... I, historic, I'm like that guy in the movie that ends up in all these things that has no idea what's going on. So Forrest is, Gump. Forrest Gump. So okay. it was, you know, Bob had a Harley and he said, you know, come on, we'll go up to this. He's got, I got tickets for these small, the small folk festival up in White Lake, New York. So we're driving up on his Harley and I'm like, Bob, there must have been a terrible accident. Look at this traffic. So, of course, long story short, we get to the small folk festival. It turns out to be Woodstock. So a week later, I meet Agneta when I, right. after Woodstock. Now, it's now December, or Jan it was January, and we, January of 1969, and, I'm sorry, January of 1970, so I've yes. known her for six months now, and it's been all this, and, and she is the only person I ever knew in those days, this is, you know, 69, who had a loft, she had, a, you know, a Great Jones Street, 47 Great Jones, she had this fabulous loft, you know, with, with the plants hanging, and it was just gorgeous. Right. And so one night she says to me, uh, you know, I'm putting her coat on, because she would come over, we'd watch, you know, the late movie, we'd have Chinese takeout, whatever, have, you know, another one was like normal. She said to me, some night you come and stay with Agneta, yes? And I thought she meant like a pajama party, and I thought, oh, we're going <laughs> to stay in her, I didn't, I was so naive. And she kissed me, and I said, like, she kissed me. Right. And I'll say to people, I never even call myself bisexual after that. <laughs> that woke up something in me that it was like, whoa, what? And I was so scared because I didn't know what lesbians did. I was so scared. Gwen Chalky loved the story. She put it in. She wrote that whole uh, story about me for the addresses project that she did. That I made Agnes to sleep with her pants on, with her jeans on. I wouldn't let her take her jeans off the first night we slept together. I said, no, no, keep your pants. <laughs> wow! I don't know. I'm so scared. So, so it just is my one of my points that I like to talk about is how you know people's sexuality is so different. Everybody is very different, and you know, and it's very hard. One of the things that's very hard for people is to be empathetic and kind of understand. Well, my experience was this, but it's not what other people's experience it is. You know, so for a lot of people, sexuality is something. 
you know, it seems so innate. Like, it's like, you know, I've always been, you know, when I dream, I dream of God. You know, for me, that's the way it was. There was never a time that I wasn't attracted to guys, and I've never been attracted to women. It's not... So, in my head, I'm like, well, how can it be that somebody, Michaela, could suddenly only discover, right? Like, how could you, some, like, a, like a switch went off, right? Yes. But people, people are different, you know? Yes. And they and also, you know, repression is very, can be powerful, you know, in a certain way. You might retrospectively also, say, think- well, actually, maybe, I mean, I don't know. I'm not going to psychoanalyze you right now or whatever. But you might have had some girlfriends, you know, in the past like when you were growing up, maybe you had a very close relationship to them, but you didn't think about it sexually, you know, Not or something. Not even close. Right. Because two things. One is when you grow up in an alcoholic home, you are very alone because you're not allowed to tell anybody anything. So right. the, whole, the whole thing of an alcoholic is don't tell anybody anything. What you saw didn't happen. Right. And the other thing, I'm sure when you talk to other women who have been sexually abused, our bodies shut down. Ah, that's interesting. Completely shut down. And right. the thing about my relationship with Peter, and it gets even more interesting later, I'll tell you what, I'll send you a videotape of what happened. Um, we didn't have sex. We uh-huh. cuddled, we kissed, because I was terrified about getting pregnant. Oh, that's I had seen what happened to my friend. So I was a virgin when I slept with Agneta. Now that's very unusual. Yeah. So that's what I mean, like in a sort of interesting way. She was were, my introduction to sex. Right. So in a way you weren't fully heterosexual and actually, but you didn't realize that because you had nothing to base it on. Right. But also kind of Now what magical, happens like is I am tale, now <laughs> in a consciousness. Susan Brown Miller got me in a consciousness raising group cool. with the New York Radical Feminist. I'm in a consciousness raising group and I think they're going to be thrilled when they hear that I'm with a woman. You know, because I, I, prior to that I've been with Peter. So I go to the group and I'm saying, oh, you know, I'm in love with this woman. And like, well, it was like Chicken Little. Oh my God, you're going to lose your apartment. They're going to throw you out of your apartment. You're gonna, nobody's ever going to hire you. You're going to be, you know, your parents are going to disown you, which I don't really care about. Your parents are going to disown you, your family. You're, uh, I'm like, wait a minute. I'm the same person I was six months ago when I was going to marry Peter, and now you're telling me that I all these right. horrible things are going to happen to me because I love a woman? Mm-hmm. Look in the back of the Village Voice. There's the ad, the Gay Liberation Front. February of 1970, I went down there, and the rest is history. Wow. So you were in a relationship at that time when that happened, the murder? Oh, yes. Oh, my God. Yeah, she was, her birthday was was Memorial Day weekend, and she left for Paris on May 15th. I to, to uh, model the Vogue's uh, fashions for fall, the fall, fall Vogue, whatever. And I got a telegram on May 21st, I believe it was, from, and it said, all it said was, Agneta is dead, let her to follow, love Shirley. Shirley was, um, uh, Shirley Hoffman is uh, Viva's real name. She's from Buffalo, <laughs> from Buffalo. Um, and that, that's when my drug addiction and my alcoholism just full, Right. So, um, that that was in, uh, you know, that was in the seven, early 70s. And so, by the time the self-portrait was shown at the Aldrich Museum, I was pretty much heavily into drugs and alcohol. Um, by the time the 80s occurred, I was part of the whole club scene. You know, just, you know, just, oof. And, and, and how were you making a living? I had my own business as a graphic designer. I was making lots of money. I was working for some of the top corporations. And how did you get into that? Um, just because uh, it was a it was an easy way for me to make a, a living and still have time to paint. Okay. But um. All right. So that's how you were doing it. But then you were also, you know, doing the drugs. So that was bad. Doing drugs, doing alcohol, you know, whatever. Um. So. And, sh- and Holly um, represented you? No, because by the time Holly came into my life, I was doing the paintings that she couldn't show. Because they were too lesbian. They were pornographic, uh. basically. They were considered, I mean, uh, oh, Mapplethorpe, you know, he was getting all his, but 
but because I was a woman. If I was a guy, I probably would have, you know, because they were they were a combination of pornography and then these lovely little, you know, and so Holly just, you know, she loved me. She, you know, helped me. She got me into my first rehab. Um, and then I was so ashamed of how I had treated her that I disappeared from the art world for a very long time. But but was it so she would just say, oh, I, I love your work and everything, but I just can't show it. Can't show it. Uh. But I, she introduced me to every, I remember Lori Anderson, right. oh, she's right. a genius, you got to meet her. I met, you know, like I said, I knew them all, Tommy Schmidt, I adored Tommy Schmidt, right. who was doing religious work, and there were some paintings I was doing that was re, were kind of religious oriented. And So, so um, getting you into so in the 80s, you're, you're making those pictures, and then... And then I was, when, and then I stopped painting for you a painting very long because time. Because of the drugs One, and... the drugs, my second rehab was in 1983 for mm -hmm. narcotics, I got sober in 1984. I couldn't work because my hands were shaking so badly. Um, I, I really had a very difficult rehab. Um, and then AIDS hit. And it's interesting because Alyssa uh, Nitchum, who's the director of uh, Leslie Lohman, asked me if I was doing art during AIDS. And I said, no, I was too busy cleaning diapers, changing diapers and cooking and visiting boys in the hospital because I got... I got clean in 1984, and we didn't even know what the hell was happening to these people. You'd be like, when I was sitting at a, in the NA meeting, I was like, where's Jose? Oh, he had a sore throat. He'll be here next week. Next week. Where's Jose? Oh, he died. Died. Yeah. You know, or somebody had a cough. He, the, oh, he had a cough. He's, he's getting the flu. And one by one, my entire NA home group is getting sick. And, you know, I go to the hospital to visit them, and the the food is on the floor outside in the hallway the parents come and disown them right in the right in front of me and say oh mm -hmm. well now they have you to take care of them or what i mean it was hell who the hell had time to make art mm -hmm. i was like i was trying to save these boys lives holding their hands until they passed on no and also it was extraordinary because you know remember in the late 70s there were all these there was a big schism between gay men and lesbians. Oh, the, that was it. Like, it was a thing, right? And then, I mean, this is, I don't want to, it wasn't worth having AIDS, right? But, you know, thank God for the women who, it was just like, it was That's like, it, to me it's like family, family is when people are sick, you forget everything else. Exactly you, what and happened. And that's what happened. If, First of all, the men and the women were always fighting in the gay liberation oh, front. Yeah. Then oh the GAA God. came along. They wanted nothing to do with women. And I talked about in 1973 that rally where they booed not just Marsha off the stage, who's talking about, you know, you're, I'm sorry, uh, Sylvia, talking about, you know, you're the gays in prison, the homeless gays, mm -hmm. and all these, like, you know, white, you know, college kids are like, get the, you know. And Jean O'Leary, they booed her off the stage. They wanted nothing to do with women. We weren't allowed to go to the firehouse on Wooster Street. And so, yes. So by the time AIDS came along, and the other thing that very few people know is why Dykes on Bikes is always the first group to go out. In 1971, the guys from GAA would not allow the women to march. They right. did not think women belonged. It was a gay men's march, whatever. Right. So word went out. And we didn't have cell phones, <laughs> internet, or anything. Word went out, and the morning, that Sunday morning of the 1971 March, Dykes from Westchester, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, showed up, and they got right in the front of the March, and that to this day, that is why Dykes on Bikes is the first group to go out. So, so to we'll tell the Flavia story, about you well, what Mark, happened yeah. is in the Gay Liberation Front, now this is in March of 19, uh, 1970, um, and the, the, when Stonewall occurred, you know, of course, obviously it was a revolt against the police and the mafia, because the mafia owned the bars, the police were paid off, okay. The lesbian bars, the mafia was still going strong, and we were their cash cow, because you know, women couldn't do it in the brambles or in the trucks. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we had no way really of meeting other women. Mm -hmm. um, and so the bars were our social life, but they were run by the mafia. And I only went to Cookies twice. 
um, and it was enough for me. The cookie, it was dark. There were these goons, these men would stand in the doorway watching the women dance. She'd come along, the glasses were very small and the drinks were very expensive and she'd put her finger in the drink and say, it's, it's warm, you better get a new one and she's always pushing the drinks. Ew. So we went, you know, <laughs> oh, it was horrible. Now you're, now you're really getting me upset. Oh, Sorry, it was horrible. Jesus. No, it was yes. horrible. Okay. So, so the Gay Liberation Front, you know, the women wanted to do an action. Mm-hmm. And so it was decided that because Flavia and I were both Italian and we both spoke the language, that we were going to, they were going to print leaflets and we were going to stand outside of these mafia bars at women's bars and get women to come to the dances which were right down the street at alternate you on the corner of 14th street and 6th avenue so we're you know we're out there handing out the leaflet and the goons come out and they're you know you know chasing us down the street and I, we yell out non toccare io non sono sangue don't touch me i'm blood so and that's very napoli town io sono sangue you know so you know we didn't learn that out of a textbook um and so I could have been Carlo Gambino's daughter for all they knew. <laughs> and so little by little, we're get, and it happened very quickly, we're getting the women out of the bars and they're coming to our dances and they're having a great time. It's like, you know, we charge like $2 for a beer, you know, a dollar for soda. Mm-hmm. We're having a grand time. So the idea of blood meaning you... you I'm you, I'm one of you. Right, so you can't... Don't touch me. Don't try to... Don't, don't, God, don't, don't mess, don't mess right, with us. Right, that's right. Right, got it. Um, so the night we're having a big dance, you know, and they're starting to notice that their bars are empty on Saturday night. And they're like, somebody, they, they saw the, 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 the uh, flyer. Mm-hmm. So alternate new was right down the street from Cookies, which was practically empty by now. And there was a long stairwell to get up to the dance on the second floor where we were. And we're all dancing. It must have been 200, 250 women dancing and having a great time. And I see the guns first. I see the door open. I see the guns. And I took the cash box and I slammed it shut and I handed it like a football off to Donna Gotchuk. And I said, put this in a garbage bag and get down back stairs as fast as you can. So, you know, I see them coming up and I'm like cool as a cucumber. I say to them, can I help you gentlemen? And they're like, where's the money? They're the gun. They got the guns. And where's the money? We want the money. I said, I'm sorry. I said, you know, we don't charge anything. This is the, and the music stops. And mm-hmm. the women are standing. They're terrified to see the guns. Right? So they're like, you know, oh, they're going to teach me. So they put the gun to my head. And they go, if you don't stop this, we're going to kill you. We know who you are. And I said, well, then you may as well shoot me right here in front of everyone. Because we're not going to stop. So then they go over to Martha. Oh my God. Martha Shelley. You know Martha, right? Martha Shelley? No. You know Martha? Oh my God. So. Martha's a writer. She lives in. in uh, she, was, she planned actually the f- very first gay pride march right after Stonewall. Oh, she okay. and Ellen Broidy over at NYU. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, they go over to. Because she's kind of a little, little. You know, she looked like, you know, somebody like very sweet, you know, glasses, curly mm-hmm. hair, like a little cherub, right? They go over to Martha for mm-hmm. Big mistake because Martha was in the GLF. They go. Do you know who we are? And so Martha goes, no, and I don't care. Do you know who we are? We're the Gay Liberation Front. So they turn around, they look, and as they were going down the stairs, I yelled at them in Italian, next time send your sisters. I was going to say send your mothers, but then I knew they would have killed me. But that was, so that was it. And within, you know, it was a very short time. And then our next big thing was the Lavender Menace. Mm-hmm. Uh, shortly after that, where we took on the women's movement, and uh, so we were very, very active. But I was not painting at this time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, I was, but I was, I got very involved in politics, and then you know, I made the porno paintings, which of course nobody wanted to show until, and I still have the catalog, which I can give you a copy of, the alternate you. Uh, I forgot his name. He was Hispanic. And he, he thought they were wonderful. He showed them. Nobody reviewed them. Polly came, but nobody reviewed them. Uh, nobody even would dare. And that was it. And so I stopped painting uh, for a very long time. I gave up thinking, well, if I can't paint what I want, I'm just going to throw myself into my, you know, my business and whatever. 
And so, I don't, I'm trying so to think tell, what tell, made me start painting again. Well, that was my next question, yeah. Uh, in 1995, I met a woman. I did not date anyone after I met it was murdered. Actually, I dated a man for eight years. So. Right, in 1995, <laughs> um, well, hey, I got sober. Part of that was I had a complete nervous breakdown when the memories came back mm -hmm. about what had happened between my father and I. And it was so bad that I couldn't function. I had an eight month major depressive episode. I didn't think I'd ever work again. I had a very big business going at that point. I was making so much money. It was unbelievable. I'm sober now. I'm, I'm almost, I'm seven, almost seven, six and a half, seven years sober. I go to a meeting with my friend Michael, who was the creative director of a very large cosmetics firm. Um, and he says to me, let's, I'm going to skip, I'm going to skip work today because I used to do a lot of work for them. Um, and he goes, let's go to, there was a very well-known gay, uh, uh, it was an AA meeting called Perry Street. He goes, let's go to Perry Street, and then we'll go have lunch in the village. I said, oh, that's great. Yeah, let's do that. So we go to this meeting. This woman starts talking about how her father had sexually abused her. Next thing I know, I'm looking at this guy sitting next to me, and I said, can you walk me home? He said, why? What's wrong? I said, I don't know who I am, and I don't know where I live. My mind, the, the, the memories that were coming into my brain at that moment were so ego dystonic mm -hmm. that my brain literally said, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm fucking out of here. I don't remember any of this stuff. Right. And I would wake up every night screaming. I would go to bed uh, crying, wake up crying, and that went on for eight months. And then I became quasi-normal again. Long story short, out of that experience, I was given so much wonderful help uh, the great therapy I was given, the help from the people in AA that I went to NYU and got a master's in social work and specialized in adults and, and children who were sexually abused. So for years, I worked in psychiatric emergency, I worked in clinics, while I was also working at the Colgate Palmolive Company three days a week until my last two years there when I was working full time and that's why I have the life I have today. Um, I made a lot of money there. I gradu I graduated. I, I retired in 2006. Was so, the so so the art part though? When did you you were getting to the point? So right? here, okay, okay. So in 1995, mm -hmm. I was doing an internship in at, in in psychiatric emergency at uh, North Central Bronx Hospital. Mm -hmm. I met a young doctor, mm -hmm. an intern in neurology. She's a very sweet woman. And so now my life starts again as a woman with a woman. I, I fell in love with her, so I ended up in Connecticut. Um, anyway, so, and she loved art. She, she actually, you know, she was, she was brilliant. She had graduated tops in her class at the Quran Institute of Mathematics at NYU, which is, you know, for all the brainiacs go. Um, and... Uh, now she's a neurosurgeon, a neurosurgeon that uh, what I wanted to be. But anyway, we start dating. Uh, she comes to live with me. And I still had some of the old paintings that mm -hmm. I had done in mm -hmm. my law, including the porno paintings. She looked at the paintings, you know, and we started, you know, a long period of talking. And she said to me, you're, you're an artist. You need to you need to go back to doing your this this work is amazing. You need to start painting again. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, it's been so long, and I just you know I don't have time. Blah, blah, blah. So she said, she said, why don't you just? She said, you know, we're living in this huge loft. I'm in this loft on twenty twenty third. Mm -hmm. I mean, twentieth Street across from Gordon Mata Clark's loft, and Julian Schnabel is my neighbor across the street. I could look into his place. Um, and so she said, "Why don't she said, let's just clear out the whole back?" And I want you to just get a sketchbook. She said, "You don't have to work. You don't have to do anything. Just sit in there. Just start sitting and thinking, and thinking." And that was the beginning of the Disney work. That I don't know what happened, but I became fascinated by. Again, stories that were real, but were so surreal that 
there was something I loved about the dichotomy. Again, it was always bouncing one thing off another. And the first painting I did in that series was, the, it was about Eric Smith, who went at the age of, I think he was, what, 13, lured a four-year-old boy, old boy into the woods and then sodomized him, killed him and sodomized him. And he looked like Dennis the Menace. And that was the very, so the painting I did had Pinocchio, and you know, and and then this little boy on a carousel. The pen, pen, pencil part was the little boy on a carousel. And then the first comic I did was in color. It wasn't in, and it it looked just like something out of a you know Dennis the Menace comic. And but the last panel is always the killer, where he looks at at you and he says, "They can't keep me in here forever." And he was just paroled. I think it was uh, a, I think about six months ago. Yeah. And you know he taught it. It's you know it's everything that's in those panels either comes from the newspaper or the people themselves. What they said. It's like the next one was Diane Zamora, the cadet murder case, where you know she she talked her boyfriend into murdering this teenage girl who was a cheerleader that he had gone on two dates with. They weren't even sexual, but she was you know. And they were. She was at the Marine, or no? She was at the uh, West Point. He was at the Air Force Academy. They were like the stars of their Texas town that they came mm -hmm. from. But she was a psychopath. And again, she the final panel in that. She's looking and she goes, "I know God will forgive me for this. God forgives everybody for everything, right?" And so it was always. And hers was the the. Uh, Cinderella dead on the ground or whatever uh, is, or is it sleeping beauty on the ground and the fairy godmothers fl floating around her um, but it was the left was the actual crime scene you see her, this teenage girl with her shorts her beautiful blonde hair and the barbed wire that she tried to get through this fence and they just kept running after her and they finally shot her and beat her and you know her little white crew socks it's just it, she looks it's almost looks like a crucifixion scene but a long story short i curated in 2004 the enchantment show mm -hmm. at art space new haven under the guidance of um denise marconish who is now one of the head curators over at mass mocha but mm -hmm. denise was the gallery director she's another one that you know she said, you have to meet my friend Kathy Batetti, who was a curator and artist in Boston. One thing just led to another, and that was the beginning of my coming back into the art world. So what are you doing now? I am doing a series of large drawings, and it's called Somebody Killed Me and Got Away With It. The first portrait is of Nicole Brown Simpson, and it's black and white there are these large pencil drawings which i'm really enjoying just doing pencil work because that's my first great love and you know and then the words underneath are you know go along with it with her it says you know why didn't the police look for the if oj didn't do it because it starts out somebody slaughtered ron and i if o, a complete stranger if if oj didn't do it why aren't the police looking for the killer um ask yourself and so then the second one I was doing is uh, Brianna Taylor and hers is talking about how it starts, she's done. That's what the police said when they walked into my apartment and something, I forgot how many bullets, whatever. And the, the only person that was prosecuted was the, was the policeman who shot the bullets into the white people's apartment next door. I mean, this is all condensed, of course, but this is the mm -hmm. story. Uh, he was charged with, um, endangering the life of a human being and her things ends with what about my life and then mm -hmm. the one i'm working on now is emily dickinson um and it says you know uh, for years i've been portrayed as this the patron saint of spinsters you know and basically i you know it's sorry but she i was i've had great love with my sister-in-law sue my whole life she was my friend from childhood and my family erased every mention of her name in our our letters before they were published. So it's like the whole idea is somebody killed something in these women, um, or, or basically killed them like O.J. and 
but got away with it. Basically, er- got away them with it. Almost. Erased them in a yeah. way, right? So there's going to be a, it's a whole series of women, and whether or not it will be shown because black and white drawings, I don't know. I would love it to be shown, but who knows? Um, and also, you know, all the watercolors. The one that's up right now on my home, my Facebook page and Instagram. You know, violence is endemic to American life, and it's the gun going off, boom, you know, with the big boom there. And that's, you know, things like that. And the the globe that says, I'm dying, where will you go? Um, They're all, you know, the watercolors are all about, you know, and I still do the Disney drawings occasionally, but uh, mostly I'm doing the black and whites now and 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 the watercolors of individual um, things. Cool. Excellent. And um, it seems very exciting. Yeah, if I become really famous and I can afford to have an, a studio assistant that will stretch the canvas <laughs> for me, I may go back to being doing the larger ones. But right. I kind of think it would be something different. I've used, I, I think I've said it a lot about with the Disney stuff, and now it would be something else. And I'm not sure what, but you know, I just keep working through the watercolors, through the drawings, and there's a whole series I want to do based on the book that I was given in first grade, which I thought was the most boring book I ever read. Look, Jane, look, spot, run, spot, run. It was the 50s. It was, you know, curly-haired, blonde, little mm-hmm. kids. About children who are psychopaths. Hmm. So, <laughs> that's a great place. My work is never light. Right, and that's a great place to stop. With- yeah.